I don't get what goes inside the head of those people who mindlessly murder strangers. But what I do know is that I hate such people. And that is exactly the reason why I'm preparing to become an FBI agent. I want to catch all of them who dare to snatch families away from each other, just like that man did to mine that night. It was around the time when I was seven and lived with my older brother Finn and our father. I don't remember our mom though. Neither did I know who she was, since no one talked about her. I remembered asking father a few times, but he always gave a silent response or walked away before I could finish my question. So eventually I stopped asking him about her and continued to live in the dark. It was not like my life was bad in any way, no. Despite not having a mother to nourish and care for me, I had the best childhood one could ask for. Dad provided us with everything, whether it was his time, food, toys, or adventures. It was Finn's ninth birthday, when father told us that we would be going on a camping trip on the beach near one of the hilltops in Florida. I remember feeling exhilarated, since I always loved it whenever father took us on camping trips. Sleeping in tents and campfire stories, everything about it seemed to scream fun. So Finn and I started preparing for it right after. By preparing, I meant sneaking our toys into the bag, which were later discovered and taken out by dad. After a long, boring three-hour drive, we finally reached the beach. Unlike other camping trips where I had seen many other campers, this one seemed empty with no one in sight. But despite being the only people on the beach, nothing felt unusual to me, so I started playing with Finn. I did notice someone sneaking around when I was in the middle of a game, and it had been a few minutes I saw that figure who seemed to be disappearing every time I turned around. But thinking it might be an animal or another camper, I kind of shrugged it off and went back to playing with my brother as our father nailed the tent into the sand. A few minutes after setting up the tent and starting the campfire, I saw a man who seemed to be around in his late 20s or early 30s walking in our direction. He was carrying an extremely dirty looking bag, which made it look like he must be hiking for days. Noticing my constant glance on him, he gave me a smile that showed his crooked teeth and walked directly to my father. He asked if he could get some water as he scanned him head to toe as if he was trying to figure out something. Although I was small at the time, I still could sense there was something off about this guy. I don't know if it was some sixth sense going off or something, but I didn't like it. So I rushed to my father and hid behind him. The man's expression flickered for a second at my action, but he went back to showing his crooked smile. Father asked the man to wait for a few minutes and went inside the tent, where he had put his bags to bring out a water bottle. Finn and I followed him inside when he whispered to us, If anything goes wrong, you run to the east side of the beach and get help. I didn't understand why he said that at the time, but I figured he must be thinking the same thing as me, maybe a bit ahead of us. I remember him calling someone and whispering something that I don't remember at the time before heading out of the tent. The man waited patiently as the three of us exited the tent with a bottle of Papa's hand, which he handed to him. His smile had gone completely at this point, and he snatched the water bottle from Father's hand and gulped it in a single breath. He wiped the water from his mouth as he mumbled something under his breath before taking out a large knife from his bag. I don't remember the exact size of the thing, but it might be around 15 inches. He started coming closer to us, so Dad started shouting and warning him that he would regret doing anything. The man started to give a hysterical laugh, and even at that age, I could recognize the malice in his eyes, which was frightening. I remember that my brother and I started crying and shaking as we were utterly horrified by the situation. In front of our father, who had probably never even harmed a fly, he looked too big, so I started imagining the worse. I remember father pushing me aside as the guy lunged towards us, and before he could protect Finn, the man had gotten a hold of him. Put the boy down and deal with me, okay? He said in a slow voice, trying to reason with the madman. Shut up! Don't tell me what to do or I'll kill the kid! The man shouted, which made us cry even louder. Okay, fine, I won't say anything. Just tell me what you want. Father said in the same slow voice while putting both of his hands in the air. He turned to look at me and signaled something which I couldn't understand. I want you to come closer, the man said in a demanding voice. What? 
father asked in confusion. Don't make me repeat myself, you shithead! The man shouted again while piercing the knife on Finn's neck, which made a small cut. Father panicked and walked towards him, but as he did, the man stabbed him in the chest. And the only sound that escaped his throat along with a painful groan was, Gwen, run. I screamed and ran as if I was waiting for his command, my snot and tears all over my face along with the hiccups that started to follow the flow of my crying sounds. I could still hear the painful screams of Finn and Father. The man was probably stabbing them, and I was going to be next after he was done with them. As I was running with my weak and small legs in the direction Father had instructed me, I bumped into someone on my way. I remembered looking up and watching two men in police uniforms who had just come out of their car after watching me run. My father, Finn, I said along with hiccups wiping my snot and tears. One of the policemen took me in the car, while the other went to where our tent was. I don't remember if they found the vicious man or not, but what I do remember is that they asked me if there was someone I could contact to inform them about my family. Later that day, when I was at the police station, Grandma came to pick me up, and her eyes were filled with tears. She embraced me in her arms while constantly saying along with her apologies and muffled cries, you poor thing. The very three words that have become triggers for my trauma. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. There are pretty disturbing posts and stories you come across while going through 4chan that is too much to handle for those who are weak-hearted. But those of you who don't know about this, 4chan is an anonymous website where one can post anything without any filter. This was back in 2011, around the time when I first got to know about the website. I was still in high school and a pretty naive kid who used to follow what other most popular kids used to do. The reason was that I was always in a world of my own, watching movies like a high school nerd suddenly getting popular and started hanging out with the cool kids, eventually ending up with the most gorgeous girl in the entire movie. What I didn't know at the time was that sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. Looking at how kids in my school were always on their phones doing nothing, I started doing the same. It was the time when I started going through 4chan just to keep myself busy. But as time passed, I somehow started to become addicted to the website, since it always had something new and interesting. I never actually posted anything or talked with anyone. I was more of an observer or whatever entrancing things were going on the forum. As I was more and more absorbed in it, I started losing interest in the popular kids and focused more on what was keeping me constantly interested. One day, when I was going through the website, I saw someone post a picture of a red painted chair with a star sign over it. I don't know why, but for some reason the necklace seemed strangely familiar, which was weird. The chain seemed freshly painted since it was still wet and was smudged all over the table it was put on. Upon looking at the picture, anyone could say that the person who had uploaded the picture is trying to boast his or her painting skills, which was pretty sloppy. It didn't seem like something to look at, so I shrugged it off, and since the class was about to start soon, I put my phone in my locker after turning it off. In the middle of the lecture, I noticed the fifth seat of the second row was empty. It looked like Annie was absent. She was the most beautiful girl in the entire school, and obviously the girl I had a crush on, since she was going to become mine someday. I was pretty disappointed that she was absent, as sneaking glances during the lectures had become my favorite hobby. She was always accompanied by her best friend Elizabeth, who was the second most beautiful girl probably playing the role of the second female lead in our story. The girl who always fell in love with the main lead, but due to my heart belonging to Annie, she would have to be disappointed in the end. The lecture ended when I was lost in my imagination, and since I wasn't able to pay attention to it, I was going to have to go to the library to give an extra hour to cover up the lesson. The remaining lectures went by just as normally as they always have been. And once I was done with the class, I went straight to the library. Looking at the number of students in our school, it was quite big. 
It didn't lack any facilities either. It had a cafeteria that served good food, multiple playgrounds, and music rooms. But what I loved the most were the two libraries. Most of the students used to go to the big library in the main building, while the second library, which was smaller in comparison, and being in the east building was not so popular despite being peaceful. It was because the east building was a bit far, and only a few classes used to be held there in rare cases. Rumors among students said that there were ghosts in that building, but they were all false since I always used to go to that library and study till late. Since the library was on the third floor and the elevator not working as usual, I started walking up the stairs, when I heard faint whispers coming from the last classroom in the left corridor. I was instantly reminded of the ghost rumors, but I shook it off because I knew very well that there was no such thing as ghosts. The door of the room was partially open, so peeked through and saw two of our students standing there. I could only see their backs, so I couldn't figure out who they were. As my eyes scanned the area, they landed on Annie's lifeless body. I couldn't stop the sudden scream from leaving my throat, causing the two students to turn immediately. For some reason, my legs gave up. I knew in my mind that I had to run and tell someone, but the cowardliness in my cells was at its peak. My body froze, my eyes stuck on Annie's slit throat. I was too petrified to be able to do anything. I somehow broke free of it, only to find that Elizabeth and Andrew weren't there anymore. They killed Annie. I had to do something, I had to tell the principal about it. And as I was turning about thinking this, I saw Andrew standing behind me with an unsettling smile forming across his lips. I was thrown around in one blow, causing my back to hit the wall and making a cracking sound along the way. He then took out his belt and started striking me, aiming mainly at my neck area. I started crawling away from him. He grabbed my left foot and started dragging me inside the classroom Annie was in. These bastards knew very well that no matter how much I scream, it was almost impossible for my voice to reach someone, and even if they did hear a faint sound coming from there, they would probably assume it was a ghost. He broke my arms and my left ankle, causing me an immense amount of pain. Before I could let out a scream, he stood on my throat and started strangling me with his foot. As I was passing out from the lack of oxygen and pain, I could see a silver star chain necklace peeking out from his shirt. Ah, I remember now. It was Annie who used to wear it. No wonder it looked familiar. These were the last thoughts that came across my mind before everything went dark. When I woke up, it was already dark. I painfully managed to turn my face around only to find Annie's body missing. Guess they might have taken it. They must have thought I was dead, that's why they left me here. Hiding two dead bodies on the same day must have been too much for them, so they cleared the one that had the possibility of rotting. Everything was broken in my body, so getting up was extremely painful. I don't know how I managed to gather so much courage, but I still managed to do it, and dragging myself out of the school to the hospital that was a few blocks away from there. Watching me walk into the hospital building in such a condition, the nurse preset there rushes to my side and took me to the emergency room. When the doctor asked me who did it, I opened my mouth to tell him. I realized I was unable to speak, since that monster stood on my throat and strangled me with full force. Don't worry, it'll take some time, but it will heal. Take some rest till now. I watched his back as he walked away after saying that. A clump of tears formed in my throat with the helplessness I was feeling. With every single hit he had given me, it was like I was forcibly shaken away from my dream to my senses. Reality is truly scarier than a movie. This is hands down the most horrifying thing that's ever happened to me. I still don't have any answers as to why it happened either, and I probably never will. I had recently graduated college. I was a marketing major, and I was having a hard time finding a job. I didn't have anything lined up for me right after I graduated like some of my peers. So I did what most people do, and moved back in with my parents. Not gonna lie, it was pretty weird moving back in after having been away for so long. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and my dog. And now I was living with my mom and dad again. It sucked. 
I normally don't talk about this very much, but when I was younger, I had a natural intuition that most people don't have. I had some kind of ability to speak to ghosts, or at the very least, to see them. I was that kid that was always was talking to the wall and claimed to be talking to a ghost. I had no idea why I had this ability, but I knew that I did and remember genuinely feeling a sense and making a connection with it. I always had to make some kind of spiritual or emotional connection with it before I was able to communicate with it. It's really weird to explain, but I can still do it. The ability never went away. It's a little more difficult now, but so I became very interested in it, especially towards the end of my college career. I spent many nights meditating, and trying to form connections with spirits around me. So here's the thing. My parents had actually moved when I was in college. I never really felt a strong connection to their new home. Honestly, I didn't really like it, and I had never spent more than a couple of nights there. Even during the summer, I would stay at my apartment in the city only because, well, why not? And again, you can see why it was so weird for me and my dog to move back into my parents' house because I've never really lived in this house. It's not that it was particularly negative or anything, but anyone who is in tune with their mind and body and moves around a lot will remember that it is distressing. Even if there's nothing problematic about it, you can be 100% financially, spiritually, physically secure and fine in every aspect of your life. Moving into a new home will invariably cause some distress. That was one Friday night when my parents had gone out for dinner. They wanted to have a night away from all the regular worries of day-to-day -day life. I had two other brothers and they're both in high school, so you can understand what my parents who need a break my brother being my brothers both went out to sleep over to friend's house. They only had a year between them, so they hung out in the same friend group. And they all had this weird thing where they would sleep over at each other's houses and just play video games all night. That's left me and my dog, Dory, and home alone, until my parents got home at least. And I remember feeling really freaked out. Not in a crazy way or anything, but Something just felt off, like there was something in the air. It was really hard to explain. I remember being in my room reading an article on the best ways to get a job. It was about 9 o'clock at night. My parents probably wouldn't be home until about 11 or 12. I remember being really into this one article. I was taking notes on things that I could do to improve my resume. And then I heard it. My dog needs one really weird noise. It was almost like a bark, but also a whimper. I knew something was wrong because he very rarely made noises. I rushed downstairs to see what was going on. He was sitting there, perfectly fine, as if nothing had happened. And this was extremely unusual. I looked around the house frantically. He had food. He'd just gone to the bathroom, and nothing around the house seemed to be out of place. I chalked up to him not liking being at my parents' house. It sounded rational enough. I made my way back upstairs to get back into the job hunting grind. And then I heard the very same noise again, maybe 15 minutes later. And this time, it really unnerved me. This was very out of behavior for my dog, and I had an odd sense of impending doom. I ran downstairs and looked around for a minute there. I didn't even see my dog. I didn't know where he was. I called out the dory, and but he didn't answer. Then I made the worst discovery of my entire existence. I realized that my dog was dead. He was just lying on the floor, motionless. It was so weird because he was only about two or three years old. I closely examined his body and didn't appear as if he had even been in a fight or a struggle of some kind. No blood, no bruises, no puncture wounds. 
It was as if he had just laid down to take a nap and died. I remember feeling really sad. That sense of fear and adrenaline never went away though. I waited for my parents to get home. I was really psyched out and I didn't know what else I could even do. I felt like calling the police was a bit too extreme and I didn't want to be the college graduate turned adult who moves back in with their parents for a week and needs them to rush home because he's scared. And this all happened a while back. I still can't explain how my dog died. I ended up landing a job a couple of days later in a nearby city, and I was really happy to have been moved out of that house. It freaked me out pretty bad, and after an incident like that, my parents can visit me any time in the future. In April of 2011, British tourists James Coops Cooper and James Jam Cazares were enjoying a transatlantic vacation in the sunny state of Florida. 25-year-old Coops and 24-year-old Jam had first met at the University of Sheffield in 2005 when both were fresh-faced first-year students. According to friends, they'd struck up an almost instant friendship upon meeting, one which would continue throughout their student years and well into their mid-twenties. The pair had apparently traveled together before, and as anyone who's been on vacation with a close friend before will tell you, if you don't end up murdering the person by the end of the trip, it's evidently a friendship that'll last a lifetime. And that's exactly what kind of friendship Coops and Jam had. Like most of the nights they spent in Florida, Jam and Coops whiled away the midnight hours by drinking beers, munching down the exquisite seafood of Sarasota, and generally being typically British in a place that defines the United States in so many different ways. The night of April 15th was no different, and as the late night ticked over into the early morning, Jam and Coops decided they'd better call it a night. They thanked the staff of whatever bar they were in, then proceeded to walk back in the direction of their hotel. But in reality, navigating their way through the dark Sarasota streets proved much easier said than done, and it wasn't long before Jam and Coops were stumbling along alleys and avenues that they didn't recognize. Not that it was a problem for either of them. Witnesses say that they were laughing and joking as they walked, spirits high due to the fine weather and strong alcohol. How could they possibly know that wandering into the Newtown neighborhood of Sarasota would be the single worst mistake of their lives? As Jam and Coops continued to stumble through the muggy Florida night, they heard a voice from behind calling out to them. It was a 16-year-old boy named Sean Tyson, who had apparently heard the two men's accents and had been following out of simple curiosity at first. But Tyson's intentions had quickly shifted from a harmless curiosity to those of an opportunistic predator. He wasn't quite sure where the men were from, but he recognized that they were both very, very drunk. Despite just being 16 years old, Sean was an experienced stick-up artist, and often carried a 22 revolver for the explicit purpose of relieving the unwary of their valuables. Some of his neighbors even said he was fond of firing off rounds into the air as a way of both celebrating and intimidating. Upon seeing the young man, it's entirely possible that the drunk and jolly Coop and James would have thought they'd simply made a new friend, a new traveling companion and someone that could possibly point them in the direction of their motel. But Sean Tyson didn't want any new friends. He wanted their money, and he wasn't shy about letting them know it. At first, the two Brits thought he was asking for money, and they were more than willing to lend him some. They were flat broke from their night of drinking, and they did have a few dollars in change to hand over. But that wasn't enough for Sean. He wanted large bills, he wanted their phones and wallets, and he wanted them handed over fast. It's only then that he produced the handgun, something that let the two friends know that he wasn't messing around. It had the exact reaction he intended it to have. In the UK, it's not straight up impossible to own a firearm, 
but the government and police make it so expensive and bureaucratically irritating that most people who begin the process give up trying to obtain one. So, generally speaking, when a non-military, non-law enforcement British person sees a firearm, it can provoke a deep reaction of awe, surprise, or even fear. And when Jam and Coop saw the revolver in Sean's hand, any potential fight that might have been in them evaporated entirely. Again, Sean determined that the now terrified friends hand over their cash, but there was a problem. It seems that both men had swapped a large amount of British currency for US dollars at the very start of their trip. This would serve as their budget and ensure they didn't overspend. Any other money in their possession was back in their hotel room, the same hotel they were struggling to find in their drunken state. Jam and Coops must have been absolutely terrified as they tried to explain this to young Sean, offering up their phones and other valuables in substitute. Sean took them without so much as a second thought, but didn't believe for a second that the two were strapped for cash. To them, they were tourists, walking dollar signs who were just holding out on him. To the two British tourists, the interaction was surreal in the extreme. They were on holiday, according to the parlance, on break from their dreary lives back in the UK. They weren't wrapped up in the subtleties of US gun laws, nor were they aware of the risk it would incur. All they had to do was show their prospective robber that they had no money. After that, all they had to do was extract themselves from the volatile situation. Walk away. Just walk away. It's what we're told to do when conflict arises. But what do you do when that conflict chooses to follow? Because that's exactly what Sean did on that humid Florida night. He followed Jam and Coops, revolver in hand, demanding they turn over their non-existent cash. We can only imagine how terrified the two of them must have been, faced with the kind of threat that would be almost alien to them, a nightmare that had become a tangible reality. The point at which Sean Tyson lost his patience with the men is unclear, but we can be quite clear that he had been following Jam and Coops for quite some time before he finally decided to act. According to his line of thinking, they were lying to him, trying to punk him. Tourists were made of money, and the two in front of him just needed proper motivation to hand over their cash. Since you don't have any money, Tyson said, approaching Coops from the rear, I got something for you. Tyson thrust the barrel of the 22 revolver into Coop's side and pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through his liver, kidneys, and intestines. A kind of horrendous penetrative pain that the young Brit had never felt before in his life. Coop's knees buckled almost as soon as the trigger had been pulled, a grunt of pain escaping him as he hit the concrete. For Jam, the terrifying reality of the situation hit him like a ton of bricks. This complete stranger, this young man that seemed no older than a teenager, he just mortally wounded Jam's best friend in the world. All he could think to do was beg for his life, collapsing to his knees beside his wounded friend whilst looking up at their attacker. Please, mate, we're just on holiday, he's believed to have said. We're drunk, we don't have any money, just please don't kill us, please. Tears formed in the young man's eyes as his friend writhed in pain on the concrete. At this point, Sean Tyson must have expected the pair of friends to give up whatever money they had stashed away. Only, they didn't. The unhurt of the two simply begged for his life. Only then did it really occur to Sean that they had been telling the truth the entire time. We can only assume that to an experienced stick-up kid like Sean, this was nothing short of an embarrassment. His instincts had been entirely wrong. He wasn't going to make any worthwhile cash out of it, and what's worse, he had an attempted murder beef coupled with a witness who had seen his face, heard his voice. He even knew which neighborhood police could find him in. There was only one way the encounter could end, and that was with Sean being the only person that walked away from it. And so, with his victim still begging for his life, Sean Tyson raised the revolver aimed it at Jam's head, and pulled the trigger. He emptied his remaining four shots into the chests of each man, finishing them off. Then, 
Soundtracked by a chorus of barking dogs, Sean Taylor picked up the shell casings that were lying on the tarmac, but he wasn't quite done yet. Sean proceeded to pull off the two men's blood-stained t-shirts as well as pull their trousers down to their knees. It's not clear why he did this. Some believe it was a way of humiliating the two Brits in death. Others seem to think it was a last-ditch effort to locate any hidden cash either of the men were in possession of. But what's self-evident is that when the cops finally arrived on scene, the street looked more like the site of an execution than a robbery gone wrong. In the hours following the shooting, Sean gave the shell casings and the murder weapon to a close friend of his, instructing him to bury both in his backyard. However, instead of following the instructions, Jermaine Bain then sold the revolver for $50. This would prove to be their undoing as police traced the gun back to him and also the shell casings. When the cops threatened to charge him with murder, Jermaine rolled on his buddy, telling the cops that Sean had been the one to kill the two British tourists. Sean, who was tried as an adult at Sarasota County Court, despite having been just 16 at the time of the murders, was given two life sentences without the eligibility of parole. Before sentence was passed, two of the British pair's friends read out impact statements to the court. For every painful detail of their deaths I have endured, for each disturbing photo I have been exposed to, I am still glad I have this opportunity to look into your eyes and try to explain the pain that you have caused. Joe Hallett, a friend of the pair's explained, Every night you go to sleep, every morning you wake up, I want you to think of my friends who you murdered. They will haunt you.